cool. Okay, now it's live, so let's give it 20 seconds. Okay. We're live. Okay, welcome everyone. Thank you for joining us today's on today's webinar. My name is Alejandro and I'm going to be your host. Today we're presenting Choose Your Own Adventure, developing a value-oriented framework for your career by Luciani Volkovitz, an astronomer at the Adlib Planetarium in Chicago, Illinois. Luciani holds a bachelor in physics and astronomy from John Hopkins University and a master's and PhD in astronomy from the University of Washington. Then Luciana did a couple of postdocs at UC Berkeley and Princeton prior to joining the Adler Planetarium. Dr. Wolkowitz is the founding director of the LSSTC Data Science Fellowship Program, an initiative to provide astronomy graduate students with training in advanced computing. Luciani studies the ethics of Mars exploration, stellar magnetic activity, how stars influence our planet's sustainability, or a planet's sustainability sorry, as a host for alien life, and how to use advanced computing to discover unusual events in large astronomical data sets. Please remember that you can ask questions over email through our YouTube channel on Twitter, and the questions will be read at the end of the talk. Now, without further ado, we will turn time to over to Luciani. Thanks for joining us. Thank you for having me and good morning, everyone, or good afternoon, depending on where you are. Um, let me get my screen shared here. All right. All right, everyone seeing my slides? Yes. Okay, wonderful. Let me, for some reason, there we go. <laughs> Um, great. Uh, so it's my pleasure to um, talk to you today. This this talk was originally developed um, back for the NSF Astronomy and Astrophysics Postdoc Seminar um, and has since been turned into an essay. So if you don't feel like taking notes today, um, there is an essay that essentially recaps a lot of this that's available on the archive that you can look up. Um, but I'm going to talk through everything today. Uh, and um, Generally speaking, I, the way I like to introduce this talk is to say that it is really a talk about um, fulfillment. So what is fulfillment? Well, I like talking about fulfillment rather than, for example, the word success, um, because to me, success sort of applies a fixed destination. It's something that has already happened that you can measure and you know by some metric and, and decide that it's a success. Um, I, I would say that careers are not uh, very well described by the word success or failure. You know, I think we all experience both of those things. Um, but a far more relevant thing to me is whether a career is fulfilling. And the argument um, that I will make uh, in the course of this talk is that essentially um, fulfillment in your work comes from when you are able to align your career path and the things that you do on a daily basis with your value system. And a cause of a great deal of happiness um, is often when uh, the way that you are valued doesn't align well with the values that you bring. So you create something, whether you know it's a work of research, a work of art, no matter what your work is, um, and you feel like you've created something of value if people are evaluating you in ways that um, aren't captured by the same way that you evaluate yourself, it leads to a mismatch and a lack of fulfillment. Um, you know, having said that, and this was noted on the previous si slide, a lot of this talk is about the things that you personally can control. Um, I fully acknowledge that you know, no no one's life is fully within their control, um, and so you know, this is about uh, not you know a surefire path to fulfillment, um, but about affecting the parts of the, your career that you are able to actually influence. So um, we're gonna talk first about sort of background and a little bit about developing that framework. And then um, I'm gonna move on to practical strategies in the second part of the talk. So the background for this is um, a colloquium that I attended when I was a postdoc. Um, I was in my first postdoc, it was around 2011 or so. Um, and the, po and the, the colloquium in question was Matthew Bales, um, who's pictured here. Matthew is an astronomer, radio astronomer at Swinburne University of Technology in Australia. And um, he got up and he, uh, you know, was about to give this, you know, 
UC Berkeley colloquium, very fancy talk, right? Um, and he said that he'd had a great time in our department and that we all seemed very smart. And then he basically like talked about how all of us graduate students and postdocs were mostly not going to be in astronomy um, for the duration of our careers. And he kind of uh, gave us this very real rundown of the numbers. And, um, you know, his, uh, he did it in, uh, in good humor. He has a very good sense of humor. So um, it was like not news that you ever want to hear, but at least it was delivered with kindness. Um, but then he did something that I'd never seen anyone do in a colloquium, which was to talk about what happened when his career wasn't going the way he planned. And for me at that time in, in my early career, I was this was very affecting because um, you rarely ever hear about people talking about things not going according to plan and how they recovered or even that they struggled, right? You would think that most people who give colloquia um, sort of walk into that colloquium having like sprung, fully grown um, into like a magnificent researcher uh, from the age of two, right? <laughs> and then they, and the next day they give UC Berkeley colloquium or wherever. Um, so this was very affecting to me because of the vulnerability it displayed and also um, the sort of creativity uh, that he displayed in crafting um, what was going to be his career, which is very successful now. Um, and I would say for Matthew, probably very fulfilling. Um, I will also say that this talk owes a debt to um, this woman at lower left, Jen Sellers. So right after I saw uh, Matthew's colloquium, um, I applied for and received a TED fellowship. And one of the primary benefits of that um, is that you are teamed up with a coach who is sort of like, um, you know, a therapist for your career and helps, um, or at least in my case, has helped me talk through a lot of um, the things that I was going through as an early career researcher. And so in, in many ways, this talk owes a debt to uh, Jen's work and um, the things that I learned from her. Um, so I'm going to talk a little bit about starting points because um, I think it's very helpful to have an idea of where a speaker is coming from. Um, I, you know, I, I will say in the context of this particular seminar that I am speaking as an American. Um, uh, you know, I'm born and raised in the United States and I work in the United States. And so um, as a U.S. person, I, my viewpoint is very much informed by that. Um, it is also coming from a place of what I call so far so good, meaning that um, the things that I'm going to describe have worked really well for me. Um, it doesn't mean that they will work, you know, fantastically for you. I am, I am not like a self-help guru. <laughs> I'm just telling you what's worked for me. Um, and also they've worked so far. Uh, so, you know, the, the thing that we'll, I'll touch on a little bit later in the talk is that you know, circumstances change, your goals change over the course of your career, and that's totally natural and fine. Um, and so what I hope that this framework will give you to take away um, is sort of a way of thinking about what you're doing so that you can be flexible and adapt when maybe you've discovered something isn't working so well. And I'd also be remiss to, um, to not acknowledge that I'm speaking from a position of privilege in that um, I have a job in astronomy, I have a job that pays me to do astronomy. Um, and so in some, in some ways, you know, the early part of your career can sort of feel like a very long tunnel that you're passing through. Um, and I am speaking from beyond the light at the end of that tunnel. Um, however, I think, um, you know, the, uh, the benefit of that at least is having a bit of hindsight on um, what worked well for me. And I'm also in somewhat of a non-traditional astronomy career in that um, the Adler Planetarium is a museum, so we don't have like a tenure system or anything like that. Um, and it's fairly unusual to have the, the balance of like research and public um, communication that I do. Um, so take that uh, as you will. Um, I'll give you a little bit of personal background um, that also informs this. And I know this is a lot of background, but I think it's actually really necessary for understanding the viewpoint of the talk. Um, uh, this is a picture of my father, Teddy Wapowich. Um, and, you know, up until a couple of years ago, I really did not understand um, how much uh, my father, and specifically my father passing away, had influenced um, my philosophy towards the things that I do and don't do with my career and with my life. Um, so when I was very young, about four and a half, um, my father went to work. And while he was at work, uh, he suffered an aortic aneurysm and died. 
Um, so really the, the last thing I remember um, is seeing my, my father go off to work. And this is always impressed upon me that your work, work should be fulfilling. It should be something that you enjoy and that um, is, is adding value to your life because it literally might be what you're doing on the last day of your life. Um, you know, very few of us get to choose like where we end our, our, our days. Um, and, you know, knowing astronomers and physicists, we very well might be at work. So you better like it. <laughs> um, I will also say uh, that a caveat to all of this sort of career oriented advice that I'm going to give you um, is that uh, your health is very important um, and that, uh, you know, one of the things you should value is maintaining your health. Um, so this is an MRI of my brain in my second year of uh, undergraduate. Um, while I was an undergraduate, I discovered I had a brain tumor um, and I had to leave school and have surgery. Uh, it took me a year longer to graduate. I actually had a very easy time, about as easy a time as you can have having a brain tumor. Um, but this left me with the lesson that I will impart to you, which is that circumstances can change very fast. Um, and that your, your health is absolutely the most important thing that you have. Um, and that no amount of work, no amount of, you know, whether your work is fulfilling or not, um, you can't do any of it if you don't have your health. So always think about that first and foremost. All right, all of that preamble aside, let's talk about how to actually figure out what your values are um, to use them to make your choices. So uh, a little bit of caveats. So, uh, and this is, I've used astronomy here, but I think um, some people might be coming from more the physics side. Uh, so, and you know, who knows who's viewing this on YouTube. So uh, I will say that I'm using astronomy for whatever field you're in. Um, and the, the framework that I'm gonna provide for you, I, making your decisions this way might not result in a career in that, that field, astronomy or otherwise. Um, what you also might discover if you dig into what your values are is that aligning your career path and your values may also not be compatible with a career in your chosen field. Um, you, in being honest with yourself, it is also possible to discover that um, your values do not align with what you thought you wanted to do. Um, and that's okay. Again, once you know what your values are, you can be flexible about how you actually implement them. Um, and I will also point out that even if they do result in a career in astronomy, um, it may not bring the fulfillment that you hope. Um, fulfillment is not something that is guaranteed. It is only something that you can make some choices towards um, that will hopefully bring you into an alignment that will be more conducive to actually feeling fulfilled. Um, the, one of the things that I, I think is important to take time away, you know, like I think we all have such busy lives and um, always like an overly full plate of like research and other activities. Um, but I really encourage you to make time to think about this in that there are very few formal opportunities to think about what your path is at a kind of high level. Um, you know, many of us, uh, myself included for sure, uh, spend most of our time sort of barreling through what, you know, whatever our to-do list looks like, right? Um, and that can be sort of a long-term to-do list of like, well, I'm going to college and now I graduated from college and now I'm going to graduate school and now I've got to go on to a postdoc. Um, but it's really worth taking some time to think about um, your path at this sort of very like high level because um, you won't find that there are many opportunities in which that sort of naturally comes to pass. Um, so make time for it. And um, I will also say that some of the activities as we like move on into the talk and think about how you evaluate your success, the reality is also that some activities are more valued in um, the sort of culture of physics and astronomy than others. Um, I think anyone uh, like myself, perhaps, who I, has a very big interest in science communication and outreach um, often discover that, you know, things like publication are more valued in terms of getting your next job than um, sometimes your outreach is, which can be very frustrating. Um, and we'll talk a little bit about how to sort of fold in um, these things that are maybe not externally valued, but internally valued to you. Um, and the, the, the last sort of uh, thing to remember is also that, um, and this is a corollary, a corollary really to the, the previous comment about some things being more valued is that you really can't prevent other people from measuring you according to their values. It like, 
not just in astronomy and physics, in life. Like you really can't. Um, but you, the thing that you have control over is making sure that the activities that you do are aligned with your own. Um, and again, uh, work might be doing what you're doing on the last day of your life. So this is, I think, pretty important. Um, all right, I'm gonna move on to um, some practical strategies. So uh, the very first thing that you really need to do um, is to think about what your values are. This sounds pretty straightforward, right? Um, and I think that uh, many of us have sort of like a vague idea of like what our values are. Um, but it's, it's very difficult sometimes to sit down and actually articulate them. I think when we, we think about values, sometimes um, what we do is roll off like a list of, you know, like adjectives or nouns, you know, just a list of words. So it's like, oh, well, you know, my, one of my values is like collaboration. Um, this is very vague. I mean, it's good to have that like, uh, you know, toolkit of words to describe the things that you like but it's very vague and it's not um, a great way of wrote this talk i was um also uh, in residence sorry Lu Lu luciane like we we miss one part <laughs> like okay. 20 seconds can you can you go back um yeah sure uh, which part sorry did you miss that. what slide was i on yeah like oh, starting this one i think this one okay yes okay sorry about that no problem um yeah this is a pretty important one so i'll definitely <laughs> repeat it okay um so your zero with order step down this path um is going to be to create a mission statement. Um, and it might sound sort of strange to have a mission statement for you personally. Usually when we encounter mission statements, they are something that, des that is um, describing what an institution does. So I'll give you two examples. Um, at the, uh, the time when I first wrote uh, the essay this, this talk is based on in this talk, um, I was in residence at the Library of Congress, um, and usually I'm, I'm working at the Adler Planetarium. So I'll give you two examples. So the mission of the Adler Planetarium is to inspire exploration and understanding of our universe. Short, sweet, to the point. Um, the Library of Congress's mission is to support Congress in fulfilling its con constitutional duties and to further the progress of knowledge and creativity for the benefit of the American people. A little bit longer, but still to the point and quite st specific, right? Um, so what you're going to do uh, is to first write a mission statement for yourself. Um, this can seem very daunting. Um, you know, I, I would suggest that you do not just sub substitute your name into like the Adler's. <laughs> the Adler's, uh, uh, you know, my, my goal is to inspire um, people into uh, scientific thinking and, and do research, right? Um, I think that's not quite specific enough. Um, and so I, I would like to encourage you to uh, engage in some questions for reflection. Um, so I, I would say that one of the most thing, uh, the most useful questions to think about um, when you're sort of trying to get into uh, the details of what you would like to be when you um, grow up academically or however else, um, is to think about who you admire and why you admire them. Um, now, this isn't to say that, you know, there has to be like a perfect astronomer that you want to be exactly like. Um, it doesn't even have to be a perfect person, right? Um, so, for example, you could pick out um, someone in astronomy who uh, writes papers that are really readable to um, people outside of their field. You could pick um, a, you know, a dancer or an activist who does like some sort of work in your community that you really um, enjoy. And it doesn't have to be something that is in the sciences, but what I want you to think about is really why you admire that person. 
Um, is it that uh, they are doing a good job of um, spreading what they do to others? Is it that they are building tools that are useful to others? Um, is it that they, you know, like have the most publications? Um, is it that, you know, they are good at speaking? Um, whatever it happens to be. And to really think about um, the things that you like about them, because I think um, when we when we admire people, a lot of times it's not that um, we think that they're perfect people or anything like that, or that we admire any every aspect of what they do. It's usually giving us some insight into um, something that we would like uh, to emulate ourselves. And so that's what I want you to think about first. Um, I'd also like you to think about what you feel your purpose is. Um, you know, like what what are you doing here on this earth? And that's really what this exercise also kind of gets into. Um, but another way of thinking about this is what's important to you. Um, so is it just making scientific discoveries? Is it also um, having the ability to have time to like go outside and hike? That could be something. Um, you know, really what what is important to you and um, and, and how does that manifest? Like, what does your, your life look like if that is um, included in it? I will say uh, that another thing to think about is what you're good at. Um, and this is something that we are definitely not asked to think about very often in academia. You know, we, we spend a lot of time sort of striving to be better at a lot of things, um, but we don't often sit down and really think about like what our skills are. Um, you know, maybe you do uh, a lot of like teaching your friends um, skills that you're using in your own personal like analysis. Um, you know, maybe you're uh, you're really great at teaching um, peers. Maybe you're great at teaching a class. Um, maybe you're really good at writing. Um, maybe you have a really good visual sense. Um, these are all things that could be uh, in astronomy or physics. It could be in your work. And it could be just in general. And the reason uh, that I ask you to think about this is not because you should limit, you know, what you do, but because it will inform your path. So, you know, if you decide that like your mission is to become the world's greatest modern dancer, um, and you currently have never studied dance, and um, you know, have uh, lots of years of study in something else, then um, your your career path will change a lot, right? If that, if that's what your mission is, and I think that's probably not the case for many people um, on the call. But having said that, uh, you know what you're good at and what you might like to be better at um, also inform what your mission should be. Um, and the last of these questions uh, is sort of like I you know I feel like I start this this talk always with like a lot of conversation about like death and illness. Um, and so this is a little bit of a morbid question, but also um, what do you want to be known for? Um, and this, the, you know, this could be like in the future, but it also could be like what, if you could imagine your friends and colleagues and family talking about you um, while you are not there and can't hear them, um, what do you hope that they're saying about you? Um, so this kind of gets in again to the things that you value and the things that you are hoping to emulate. Um, so just a recap, this is uh, who do you admire and why? What do you feel is your purpose and what's important to you? What are you good at? And what do you wanna be known for? Um, so kind of sit down and, and reflect on those. Um, ultimately, what you wanna do is write something that is about one to three sentences. So um, like I said up here, it's a mission statement, not a mission book. Um, you have lots of times to be wordy, but I think um, really uh, holding yourself to sort of an economy of, of words um, to be very thrifty with how many words you spend on your mission statement can be helpful. Um, and I would also encourage you to get a friend to read it. So maybe if you're watching this with someone else in your department um, or, you know, I don't know, you can probably connect via uh, comments below. But maybe find somebody who will read your mission statement um, and then uh, give you some feedback on it. Because if you can't explain something, you don't really understand it. Um, as, a, as a sort of a last statement about this uh, mission, mission statement crafting exercise, um, remember that a mission statement can be something that describes where you are at now and that um, you know, the mission statement can change too. So your, your personal mission in your career might change. Um, and the reason that there's this, this lighthouse here is that what you really want your mission statement to do is to be that lighthouse, right? It's sort of that like guiding light 
that gives you um, a sense of direction. What you do not want is for your mission statement to become some sort of anchor that ties you into something that isn't serving you anymore. Um, so uh, think about your mission statement, not as something that you're committing to for the rest of your life, but that describes where you are now. And it's really, really good to go back and look at it every once in a while, um, just to make sure that you're still kind of um, in sync with what you had originally identified. And then if you're not, that's okay. Um, but you wanna dig into like why that might be and whether something, whether you're off course or whether something about the mission is no longer um, working for you. So I wanna talk a little bit also about making um, conscious choices. Uh, so when I was first on the job market, um, I really like, I think that um, sometimes when we look at sort of our job prospects as astronomers and junior astronomers in particular, um, it can be sort of uh, pan panic inducing to say the least. Um, you know, we, uh, we sort of know the statistics about jobs and it can be very tempting to like apply for everything. And that is like very much what I did when I was first on um, the job market for I think the first couple of rounds. I just applied to anything and everything that I thought was even possibly a good fit. Um, I would advise you to not do this. Um, you, you, will need to choose consciously where um, you are going to apply in part because um, it generates a tremendous amount of work for you and for um, everybody else who's involved in the job search to just scatter shot send your application everywhere. Um, so don't apply to everything, but um, I'm gonna give you some tips for choosing where to apply. Because the, the idea, right, is that planting seeds is good. It's it's not necessarily that um, it's not good to like throw your hat in the ring for things. And I think um, particularly I encounter a lot of students who count themselves out before they actually apply for things. Um, and so, you know, the, this is not to say that you should count yourself out, um, but you wanna make sure that the, um, the things that you go after are focused, right? Um, you don't need to go into a bunch of unfocused pursuit. You have a ton of other stuff to do, I am sure. So remember to kind of strike that balance between planting seeds and um, just going overboard with the applications. So um, my, my questions for you to reflect on here um, in terms of making these conscious choices um, is, and this I'll, I'll point out is can be for, um, this can be for job applications or it can be for any opportunity that comes along, right? It could be that uh, let's say you have a very busy summer ahead of you and somebody has asked you to come and give a talk and you are not, it'll require some reorganization of your time or be a burden in some way, you're not really sure if you wanna go do it. Um, so rather than reflexively saying yes, so being totally on the side of like more irons in the fire, more planting of seeds, um, sit down and take a moment to think, how well does this opportunity fit with my mission and my values? Um, and then uh, by this time you have your mission statement, right? So you can kind of compare those two things. Um, I will also say that the other thing to think about is what is new and different about this opportunity? So for example, if you are being asked to give a lot of talks, um, which you know you, you might be in the, in the course of your career, um, then the question might become, well, uh, you know, does this duplicate something that I'm already doing? Um, you know, am I giving the same talk to kind of the same mix of people that I did at that last conference? Or is this workshop reaching a different audience? Um, does this give me a chance to talk about new research? Uh, does this opportunity give me a chance to meet people um, that I wouldn't have met otherwise? So thinking very specifically about like why you might want to pursue an opportunity, um, I think could be very helpful. Uh, I would also say that anytime you take on something additional, um, you should sit down and think about what the demand is going to be on your time. And um, this will be very much of an iterative process if you are anything like me or, or many of the people that I have spoken to, and that uh, all of us, because we're not usually asked to think about um, quantitatively how much time something is going to take, we uh, tend to underestimate how long it's gonna take. And in my case, if I make an estimate of the time demand, I usually have to multiply it by two to three. Um, 
I will, I will say I am only slightly better at this than I used to be. Um, and it, it's something that you very much learn to um, learn from your own experiences, right? So if you are actually making estimates of how long something is going to take, you can then compare with how long it actually took. And that informs you about um, your sense of time um, and how much of a time commitment something really will be for you in the future if something similar comes up, like writing a new talk, going on a trip, going to a conference, et cetera, taking a new project on, a new collaboration, whatever it happens to be. Um, and the last one I think is the, the most difficult one in that uh, having made that time estimate, um, there is only so much time in the world, um, unfortunately. <laughs> um, you know, We only have so many hours in a day, only so many days in a week. And so sometimes it's helpful to think about what you would be willing to give up for the opportunity. Um, so if something is going to make an extra 10% demand on your time, it has to come from somewhere. And that could be, uh, you know, it could be your sleep, it could be your exercise, it could be your time with your family, it could be another project. Um, without thinking about where that time is going to come from, in my experience and what I have observed in others, um, it usually comes from somewhere that you didn't plan. And that's where your health suffers, your relationships might suffer, um, your other collaborations might suffer. And so it's really, really helpful thinking about if there's a trade-off that you're going to have to make to take on that new opportunity. So just to recap, um, how well does this opportunity fit with my mission and values? What's new and different about it? What's the time demand? And maybe multiply by two to three. And what am I willing to give up? Um, so I'm going to give you a couple of uh, really brief personal examples um, of how those questions informed some choices that I made. Um, and then I think we'll have some um, time for this. I'll still be speaking for a little while, but we'll have some time for questions towards the end too. Um, so uh, two examples of what jobs do I apply for? Um, the first of these is uh, that, you know, I spoke about like being first on the job market and just applying for everything. Um, I much later in uh, the various amounts of job cycles that I went through, um, and this was informed, I think, also by the fact that in my last postdoc before I got my job at the Adler, I um, applied in my second of three years. So I had an opportunity on the job market where I was, I didn't feel completely desperate and under the gun to try and get something, right? So um, rather than just applying, you know, willy-nilly for everything, um, what I did was I wrote a short explanation for every job that looked interesting to me of why I was a good fit for the job and also why the job was a good fit for me. Um, and, it, you know, in my experience, uh, in prior years, I probably could have done that with other opportunities that I applied for, but it probably would have taken me some sort of mental gymnastics or a lot of thought if you are a good fit for the job, you should be able to write it down, um, you know, like why the job is a good fit for you and why you're a good fit for the job um, in, in pretty short order. Like after reading the, the job description and maybe doing a little research on what the, if you're not familiar with the institution, it helps to go look and um, see what their, uh, their department is like, but you should be able to write down what the fit is. And if you can't do that, it might be worth passing on applying for that job. Um, that, that is your evaluation to make. But I would argue that um, your energies are much better spent focusing your applications on jobs that um, you think you're a good fit for and that you really have a, a fighting chance for. Um, having said that, uh, at some point, you know, I, I am sure everybody watching is, um, well, I, I hope everybody watching is doing great and that you will have the opportunity to evaluate a job offer in the future. I'm sure that you will. Um, so let's say that everything goes great and that you, uh, you then have an offer and you would like to evaluate it. Um, so when I was uh, on the job market the last time, the, the time that I selected to work on the Adler, I had used this, uh, this framework of writing down kind of why I was a good fit for these various places that I applied. And I, what I realized in the process was that I'd actually probably be happy at a variety of different institutions. Um, that's not the case for everybody, right? Some people really want to be at like a research university, um, very focused on like graduate education, right? 
Some people prefer to be at primarily undergraduate focused or undergraduate only um, institutions. And uh, when I was on the market, I applied for kind of a, a sampler of all of those things and um, ended up interviewing for, for several different ones. Um, and ultimately the offers that I got were from the two most different institutions that I applied to, one which was a very traditional physics and astronomy department in a research university. And the other was the Adler Planetarium. Um, so very opposite ends of the spectrum. And it can be very difficult, right, to compare things that are super different. Um, and so I sort of sat down and thought about, you know, like what do these uh, jobs offer me? Um, so uh, at the research university, um, I feel like in, in astronomy, this is particularly true in the US, um, but I, I don't know that it is true in other countries, but I have the impression that it is. Um, research university tenure track position as a, as a professor is considered like the pinnacle of existence, like where it's what we're supposed to all want. Um, at the time when I visited the department, uh, I asked them, um, you know, like, how do you evaluate, like, what does success look like for um, an, an assistant professor? Um, what do you need to do in this department? And the chair, and this is actually a quote, said, do a lot of research, public lo a lot of papers, don't mess up teaching, and you can do outreach when you have tenure. Um, and I was like, whew, that was very honest. Um, remember that like tenure in most, most places is like a six year plus long process. Um, so to me, I, I heard that and I was like, well, you know, a lot of what I do is public communication and outreach. Um, and that, that would be a significant, um, downside to me to, you know, like have this job that's the, supposedly the pinnacle of existence, but for six years in the beginning of it, I, none of the things that I really enjoy doing on a daily basis will be valued, um, except for writing papers. Right. Um, so that was not super appealing to me. Um, and, you know, like, again, my, uh, my entire worldview is formed by what happens if I like drop dead tomorrow. So like, what happens if I, you know, don't do any kind of public communication for five years, and then, I'm, you know, because I'm working towards tenure, and then I get hit by a bus, then I will have spent the last five years of my life not doing something that is really important to me. So that was one, one aspect of it. Um, the Adler, on the other hand, gave me the opportunity to do lots of public um, communication uh, because it's not a research university. It's um, what I like to call a normal people job where, <laughs> um, where you just like have a job and, you know, like if you're doing well, you don't get fired. Um, so, but, you know, a lot of people, tenure is very important to them. Um, I do not happen to be one of them. Um, it also comes with lower pay. It's a nonprofit educational institution, a museum. And so um, they don't have like the endowment that um, something like a research university has. Um, it also doesn't come with things like graduate students or undergraduate students. So, you know, when you become a faculty member, some of your output um, is actually because you are uh, coaching students and mentoring students through their research. And um, it, it has turned out in the past couple of years that I do actually work with students from time to time, but it's not a guaranteed part of my work. And so I would be passing up essentially um, the sort of uh, culture that I grew up in, academically speaking, of having like a research group with a PI and a bunch of students, um, which I enjoyed, but I decided was essentially not, um, not something that was going to be uh, a barrier to me taking this job. And, you know, ultimately, uh, so these two pictures on the right under the Adler are pictures of an event um, that I, I created there called Galaxy Ride, where we like took all of these um, science demonstrations like out into rural areas in uh, the state of Illinois. Um, and it's an example of the kind of program that like really speaks to my heart and is, um, you know, something that I really enjoy creating. Like, look at all those faces, they're so happy. Um, you know, it is not something that I feel great about. <laughs> like, I don't get the same feeling from like just writing research papers, although I do write research papers as well. Um, it's just not something that is aligned with my values in the way that creating an event like this is, which meant that the Adler was a place that I was more likely to experience actual fulfillment um, than this research university, even though everything about my academic upbringing and culture had always told me that what I should want was working at a research university. Um, so in these last couple of minutes, um, I wanna make sure and leave time for questions. Um, 
I'll give you some example of evaluation metrics. So, you know, in the abstract for this talk, um, I talked a lot about how, uh, you know, papers are something that are is so, so emphasized um, that your publication rate is kind of like the coin of the land when it comes to um, academic jobs. That this is not to discount that, that is a reality of our field. Um, I will point out that uh, there are other ways to evaluate yourself. So like I said at the beginning of this talk, you can't prevent people from evaluating you with their own metrics. And it is important to be aware of those things, but ultimately you have to be evaluating yourself as well. And I will point out um, that you know, the, the fact that research papers are so valued, that your publication rate and your H index or whatever is so valued, um, is, is something that is like culturally imposed by the value system um, that we astronomers as a whole have kind of agreed on. Um, and the fact that, uh, that that is the case, you know, it doesn't, it's not like a rule that came from anywhere else. Um, but the fact that that's the case means that uh, you also have the ability to influence that, right? Cultures can change. Um, and so, you know, if you, if you don't feel that like publications are, are exactly the thing that should only be used to evaluate how well people are doing, um, then you have the ability as a person who is in the field to push back on that as well. Um, but really the heart of this, rather than any kind of cultural change, right, is to say that you're making these decisions, right? Hopefully they are in line with your values, but how do you know if you're doing uh, well at what you're doing? So, um, you know, when we think about like metrics, um, you can think about like your metrics in terms of your progress as being the outward evidence of your value system. So um, you don't need to get rid of any of the like traditional metrics like publication rate. It just help, is helpful sometimes to have ideas about what your personal metrics for whether you are doing well um, is in addition to those. Um, so for example, um, and these are some of the things that I work with. Uh, so referrals of people in need. Um, I, I get sent a lot of students um, who are you know, maybe struggling with uh, issues in their, in their work. I view the fact that I get referred these students as an expression of trust and um, respect by the rest of the community. Um, usually their advisors or peers that send them to me. Um, I also do a lot of student mentoring. Um, I'll say for spaces and created for enfranchisement, um, what I mean by that is spaces in which um, a wider uh, range of humanity can participate in um, whatever it is, usually in my case, science, um, so the as sort of output of science research, right? So um, one aspect of that is uh, creating more opportunities for inclusion within the sciences itself. And then also um, making sure that the work that we're doing is actually getting out into the public um, that can appreciate uh, what we're doing, even if they're not scientists themselves. Um, and one of the more straightforward network uh, metrics is also just audience numbers. You know, um, like if I give a public talk, how many people are there? Um, how many people am I able to reach? Uh, whether it's like social media or in person or through an event that I like co-organize at the Adler, um, the number of people that I'm actually getting out to, um, I think is a pretty straightforward metric. And some of these like squishy things of like, you know, like, well, how many people I'm reaching? Um, you know, or how is my message getting out is sort of a squishy way to, to say something like that. But things like audience numbers, you can ask yourself some, some um, you know, very quantitative questions of like, how many talks, like how often, to who? Um, and that can help you narrow down what um, those metrics are and how um, you think you're actually performing um, in accordance with your own values and your mission. So just a few takeaways here, um, and these are the sort of final caveats, is that uh, playing by somebody else's rules, um, so you know, being the most like publication productive astronomer in the entire world will not necessarily result in you getting a job. Um, that can be very uh, daunting, but it also means that you may as well play by your own because then you are hopefully uh, closer to being fulfilled throughout your process and not focus solely on whether you've gotten like a permanent job in astronomy or not. Um, it also is very helpful as you're doing these, uh, these reflections to know your relationship to risk. Um, so, you know, one of the things that informed my final or my last job decision um, was that I didn't 
feel like I wanted tenure. Um, but that's not a great choice for everybody. Some people really do want that job security. Both of those choices are totally valid and totally fine. Um, but it really helps to um, dig into how much you like to be at risk versus not, um, because people have different levels of comfort with that. Um, having said all of the stuff, you can you know, be living as close to your values as possible and you can still fail. Like I said, fulfillment is not the same as success, success and failure. Um, success and failure are things that happen in the course of a career, no matter how fulfilling. Um, it is just part of being alive. And so that's, uh, that's okay. Um, and, you know, hopefully you will have the flexibility if all, if everything, you know, like goes in down in burning flames, um, hopefully you will have the flexibility to be able um, to pivot and to make um, some other choices that will serve you well. Um, the, the last thing I want to leave you with is that uh, I think when we um, have academic career paths, it can be very tempting to think because you've spent all of this time, right, um, creating very specialized skills. It can be very tempting to think that you only have skills that are very specialized. But I really don't think that that's true. Um, an education in, in the sciences really does give you the ability to um, do things like uh, construct logical pathways towards answering um, very complicated questions. It gives you um, you know, sort of the practical technical skills, you know, if you learn one programming language, you can learn another programming language. If you learn one piece of clunky software, you can learn another piece of clunky software. You might even be able to learn some non clunky software. So you're much more flexible and adaptable than um, our academic training would lead you to believe. And so I think that can be very empowering um, in that I, I hope this allows you to see how you can be effective, not only in your career, but in more places in the world. So having said that, um, thank you to all of the, the friends who um, in, worked on this talk with me um, and giving me feedback um, and also being inspiring examples um, throughout, uh, throughout my own career. And I really hope that this is helpful um, to you who are listening online. Um, and yeah, now I'll take some time for questions. Thank you, Luciane. Uh, it's, it's a wonderful uh, colloquium and talk. And I think it's very important. Let me see. I don't think I turn off my video. And I think it's very important for uh, for the community um, because these type of things are not typically discussed. Like when I when I go when I went to academia for the first time, nobody told me like things. Um, so thank you for your time. Thank you for accepting our invitation. Let's thank see you for the invitation. Our, it's been fun. <laughs> let's see if our um, coordinators have some questions. I was wondering if I could ask something. Sure, sure. Uh, Lucian, thank you so much for that talk. I think that was the most valuable one hour spent in a long time. Um, <laughs> so I just wanted to ask you, I think this is something that a lot of early scientists, uh, graduate students and postdoctoral researchers included feel, because in our particular field of research, we may end up spending a lot of time and putting a lot of efforts into projects without really having something tangible or you know something to show for it. You may not end up with a paper always. Um, that's one aspect of research. And, you know, the other aspect could be if you're not a researcher, you may be applying to a lot of places without any success. So how do you, what are your tips to like keeping yourself motivated in the face of rejection, whatever that rejection may look like to you? It could be like, oh, I spent two years working on a project. I don't have anything to show for it. Or I've been applying to so-and-so for so-and-so jobs without much success. So what are your tips to, you know, keep yourself motivated to keep doing what you're doing? Yeah, I think um, rejection is really hard, obviously. Um, and it is something that I think um, it's helpful to keep in mind, first and foremost, that rejection happens to everybody all the time. Um, and that rejection is not a uh, personal referendum on you and your, your value as a person. I think um, something that happens in astronomy a lot is that we tie up our job, um, our careers with our identity. Um, you know, that that's sort of like, I am an astronomer, I am a physicist. But, you know, your work is actually not who you are, um, and you have value outside of your work and what you do. Um, the first time somebody said that to me, I was like, mm, what? <laughs> um, but, you know, it, it bears remembering that first and foremost. Um, I would also say that, uh, you know, sort of 
that idea, the, so to use your example of um, a research project that doesn't result in a paper, right? That like, I have nothing to show for it. I would say is um, a manifestation of this sort of singular focus that our field has on publications, right? If you spent two years doing something, chances are you developed some skills, um, whether it was you know familiarity with uh, a particular data set, a particular analysis tool, um, maybe some lessons learned about like why it didn't um, it didn't result in a publication. So you actually probably did get something out of it. Um, you just didn't get that one thing that is uh, sort of considered the, the coin of the land. Um, and that, that aspect of it is going to be hard no matter what. But I think realizing that the process of, um, the process of leading to something, even if it doesn't lead to the thing that you want, um, actually does give you uh, skill development um, that you might not have gotten otherwise and trying to understand like what it is you can take away. So like, what is your, you know, like you didn't publish, but like, what is the other prize that you can take from this experience? Um, I think uh, applying for jobs, like being unsuccessful in the job market is really, really hard. Um, and, you know, it, in some senses, um, you know, it, it is helpful um, sometimes to not have the, um, to not anticipate that you won't feel disappointed or unmotivated. Um, you know, the idea that you should feel motivated all the time, I think is not very realistic. And I think there are plenty of times in my life when I've gone through like periods of rejection where I did not feel particularly motivated. Um, and in those moments, it was, you know, helpful for me to return to um, things that I did like doing. So, you know, whether that's like turning more um, into my research or, you know, whether it means like taking more time to just do things that are not my work. Um, I think allowing yourself uh, a little bit of time for that sort of grieving process so that you can refresh and try again, um, because that's ultimately the thing is that you, you will have to try again. You know, if you are at the point where like you went through a job cycle, you didn't get anything and you are like out of funding, um, you know, one of the things that those job applications can give you, for example, is um, I, I think job applications are a huge time sink um, for anyone who hasn't like done this process at any point, like writing job applications is, is like a job in and of itself. Having said that, by the time you've written a job application or two or five, um, however many you've written, uh, those also can be turned into grant applications. Um, so if your your real intent is to stay in the sciences, it might be worth looking into and you're like out of your your job, which is a like worst case scenario for many people. Um, you know, you can look into soft money institutions and try and go for a grant. At the same time, um, I think if you've gone through this process and you have at least like a sense of um, your value system and what you'd like to be doing, one of the one of the ways this has worked, at least for me, is that it's been um, it's made it easier for me to identify opportunities that are within the scope of what um, I find valuable to do that aren't necessarily in academia. Um, and so, you know, if you end up where you are turning to like looking for like a job outside of astronomy or physics or whatever it happens to be, um, you might have a better way to, um, you might have a better way to evaluate what opportunities will be good for you. But, you know, there's nothing about rejection that will not be hard. Rejection sucks. <laughs> Thank you, Lucien. Thank you. Um, do we have more questions from the coordinators? Yes, I have a question for Lucian. Okay. Uh, first of all, very nice. I like a lot your your colloquium, especially because I most of the thought that you, you were talking about, also I could I, I pass by this as well, in the sense all the the, the different step, the questioning, the, the where I'm going and all this stuff. So I, I feel that your words were reflecting on on my own uh, cho choices that I did in, in my career. So, but I wanted to, to ask you about how it is expected also to behave the other side of the of the equation, let's say in, in, in my case, like, okay, we are trying to open some postdoc position and then how the, the, the other side, the university side or the research institute should 
try to behave in the best way to 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 take this new guy or girl that is coming to the to the institute and make it feel motivated and not lose it because of because there are some places in which just you go like postdoc and it's okay you have to do your work alone and if you not produce you are out of the of the of the institute it's kind of too cold behaving mind for the institute i don't know if you i don't know in your personal experience or in the how they do it in the Adler planetarium i don't know yeah um so i think that's a it's a hard question right because um institutions are so different um and you know fundamentally what you're getting at right is is a variety of different things one is you know how does the institution value somebody that is coming in um is you know is it solely on papers is it solely on like research output um do they look at things that the person might do in addition to that whether it's like say they play a sport or they do um, something outside of the department do they view that um there are many institutions that view that as a distraction um, to like time that could be spent doing research, which um, personally I find to be a very like unrealistic way of thinking about how human beings work. Um, you know, I, at least in my experience, find that time that I'm spending not doing research, uh, actually, you know, like somewhere in the back of my mind, things are brewing, um, but I don't have to be like sitting in front of my computer all day. And in fact, I don't do research very efficiently if I sit in front of my computer all day. It's just more time spent, but not necessarily, uh, doesn't correlate with um, increased output. So, you know, in part, it's um, a resetting of the values of our community. Um, you know, and I think being intentional about um, for what, something that all institutions can do, I think, is to be intentional about um, what a successful career might look like um, and and making that a much wider definition than it currently is. Um, and I, I think that that is that's really hard to say like bl make a blanket statement about what every institution should do. Um, I will say that uh, one of the things that I've really enjoyed about um, being at the Adler is that uh, there is a much wider, variety of skill sets that are considered um, valuable. And, you know, anytime, like, for example, that, uh, that we do like a public event. So, you know, like, let's say we, we just had this big, like, event called Adler After Dark, which is like a sort of 21 and up nighttime event party atmosphere, but people learn science, right? Anytime we do an event like that, the team that works on it usually only has one astronomer on it of like, 10 to 15 people. Um, and the rest of the people do things like build the exhibits. They do things like manage the project, um, you know, manage the budget of the project. They might interface with like outside partners. And so the, the vast majority of people that I work with now on a regular basis don't have any formal training in science whatsoever. Um, but they work in a scientific institution and it's okay for them to do that because there are people that have formal training like myself or another astronomer on that team. But like, I don't have any uh, like formal project management training. And that's I think true of almost everybody in astronomy who manages a project. We do not have formal training in like 99% of the things we do. We don't have formal training in writing. We don't have formal training in communication. Um, so, you know, I think, um, Part of, part of the issue, right, is that in most institutions, um, the value is placed in this very hierarchical sense where like you're either a tenure track professor or you're nobody. <laughs> and there isn't a value placed even on like the people who clean and maintain the building, right? Like the fact that you go into an office every day and like the, you know, the garbage goes somewhere, like some, a person did that. Um, and that is part of the, the enterprise of science as well. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Uh, we have a couple of questions on the YouTube channel. I, I think we have time for the first one. So this person said that in 2010, uh, A.V. Love pointed out on archive that young people don't take risks and only work on set of research, on set research agendas or on fat topics. Uh, that they don't stay, spend any time working on a risky slash non-mainstream idea. Do you concur with this? Uh, any comments? The person, this person is Shan, Shanatao Dissay. 
Yeah, um, so I, I think I'll agree with Avi on that. Um, I think that's definitely a correct observation is that there's a very low tolerance for risk in, in research. I will say that it is extremely e easy for Avi to say that <laughs> um, because Avi is a tenured professor at Harvard. <laughs> Um, so, you know, like Avi has a lot of um, sort of uh, social privilege, I would say, in that he can write whatever um, article he wants to write. He can write up some, you know, like totally like outlandish idea um, and put it on the archive and, you know, like, or he could submit it to get published because of who he is. He has a higher, um, higher uh, chance of it being published because of who he is, he can drop something on the archive and people will say like, oh, this is Avi being Avi, not, oh, this person has published a totally outlandish idea, right? Um, so I would say that part of that is the social capital that Avi has to be able to write on riskier um, topics is, is a major part of like why he has that opinion. But I think he is right that people um, do tend to be fairly risk averse in, in astronomy because of how tight the job market is. And um, again, because our, our focus is so narrow on um, th this sort of like idea of research output. Um, you know, Remy, what you said at the beginning of like, oh, I worked for two years on something and it didn't result in anything. Um, the having, a, having a, um, an enterprise of science that only values that I think works against any kind of like riskier or more exploratory idea um, that we might want to to look into. Um, it's certainly something that like I have grappled with. So I I work on um, un unsupervised machine. Well, one of the things I work on is applying unsupervised machine learning as um, a method of doing SETI or the search for extraterrestrial intelligence, which is about as out there as you can still get um, and be uh, still an astronomer, right? Um, so, you know, for me, what I am doing is a lot of exploratory data mining, and it absolutely slows down my publication rate, um, you know, but on the other hand, part of the reason I can do that is that I'm at an institution that values the, the greater portfolio of what I do. So I actually wrote um, an article for the Washington Post, for example, on that, that talks about Avi, and talking about like why um, scientists sometimes make outlandish claims. And, um, you know, like that for me, like in my position, writing an article for a major um, national newspaper is as valuable to the Adler as if I had written a research article. In some ways it's actually more so because I'm reaching a wider variety of people. So, you know, I think the, the risk that I've been able to embrace in part comes from um, the way that I am valued by sort of my immediate scientific community. And, you know, I, I wish that we would be more risk tolerant than we are because I think um, people could be more creative and, uh, and, not, and also work on a wider variety of topics, right? Because the, the thing that every, everybody gets kind of pushed into is that you develop expertise in like one area and then you can like never study anything else because you'll have to learn a bunch of stuff and then your publication rate will slow down. Ah. Um, so it would be really nice if we, uh, it not even like, so that we could work on like risky or non-mainstream ideas, just so that we could have a wider variety of um, topics that we might embrace uh, and not be so driven to be hyper-specialized. Thank you. Um, so. There is a, always a 20 second delay on the YouTube channel. So maybe that person has a reply or something. <laughs> um, but it, I have another last quick question. Maybe I was wondering if you can comment on, on your experience with the Adler Planetarium or maybe your colleagues uh, outside academia. How do normally contracts work? Because uh, I know more from the academia one, like you will go let's start as an assistant professor, let's say, then eventually you might or might not get tenure track but then you can stay there forever. So mm -hmm. these type of contracts you mentioned in your slide are not tenure track per se, but they might be also stable without being tenure track, right? Could you please comment on, like, on the basis of those type of contracts? Yeah, sure. Um, you know, uh, and, and again, this is informed by like what jobs are like in the United States, because um, that's where I'm coming from. But, um, you know, what I have realized in having friends like outside of academia is that 
um, and in particularly working in, in a nonprofit atmosphere is that um, gone are the days where people like went to work for a company and then work there until they die. Um, you know, generally speaking, one of the things that I have found most surprising about working at the Adler is that there is turnover and that people leave not because like their, their money ran out or because like the job wasn't going well, they just leave because they decided they wanted to work on something else. Like this, is, I mean, it sounds like totally like a normal thing. If you think about <laughs> friends you maybe have um, who have just sort of like regular people jobs, but people leave because they are like, well, I spent four years in this job and now, um, you know, like I think I've learned everything I can learn from this job. And, you know, like maybe I could go up in the hierarchy of the job, but maybe those positions above me aren't appealing. Like the actual like things I would be doing on a daily basis aren't what I want to do. So I'm going to go take the skills that I have and work somewhere else. And, you know, in many cases, um, you know, I've seen formal, former Adler colleagues like go on to work at other museums. I've seen former Adler colleagues like go on to work on political campaigns, um, you know, to go and like start their own business, like doing some kind of art. Um, and it, it's been really eye opening to me as a person who was so steeped in academia for so long that like you can just you can just do that. Turns out <laughs> you can go like get another job at any time that you want. Um, and, you know, there are people that have worked at the Adler for like decades and decades, um, it, despite it not being tenure track. Um, but the only people in the, the, the culture that most of the astronomers in the Adler come from of being academics is like totally alien to most of the people in the institution. Um, they all come from like regular jobs, nonprofit world jobs, museum jobs, et cetera. Uh, and I think this is going to be the last question. Uh, they said, uh, Jocelyn Bell experienced imposter syndrome when she started grad school at Cambridge. How do you tackle this problem if you face it, if you face it as a young scientist? Um, yeah, I mean, I think uh, one of the, one of the um, best articles I've ever read on imposter syndrome was, I think, I think it was written by the pr former president of MIT. Um, so, you know, like MIT being this like very you know, prestigious scientific institution, right? Um, it was interesting to uh, to read because like she talked about how um, imposter syndrome has manifested for her over the course of her career, right? So like when she first was sort of out of her parents' house and on her own and in college, she had imposter syndrome about eating in a restaurant because eating in a restaurant was something that she didn't grow up doing and she felt um, like she didn't belong in a restaurant. Um, and, you know, like now that she is the president of MIT, it's sort of like hosting a dignitary from another country gives her, <laughs> you know, imposter syndrome, but she can eat in a restaurant just fine. <laughs> um, so I think the, the thing about imposter syndrome is that it is, it's tremendously common. Um, I think it affects, uh, people, um, it affects people throughout their lives in different contexts. And it affects, I think, a, the vast majority of people. The reason you hear about it with, um, you know, women or people of color in the sciences, uh, you know, is, is that the more, um, the more the field doesn't look like you, so, you know, uh, the, the less represented you are, the easier it is for what you see around you to, um, to provide a, a seeming kind of evidence to your feelings of imposterism, right? Like for a white man in astronomy who is very well represented, um, you can look around and be like, well, everybody here looks like me, so maybe I'm in the right place. You know, if you are a black woman in astronomy, um, that may not be the case, and in many cases isn't. And so, you know, imposter syndrome, um, I think is a universal feeling. I think it, it, it predominantly affects people who are being marginalized by the field. Um, but you know, it, it's important to realize that it doesn't, it's, it's a lot like fear, right? Like being afraid of something doesn't mean you shouldn't do something. Um, it can be something that exists alongside whatever it is you're doing, you know, as long as the thing you're doing is not like literally going to kill you. Um, <laughs> it's sometimes okay to do things while this sort of, um, seemingly negative emotion is also happening. Thank you very much again for on behalf of the Low Physics and the broader community. 
um, for attending and for this wonderful webinar slash colloquium. My pleasure. Uh, thank you so much for the invitation. Thank you. And thank and you to everybody online who joined. Yeah. If you have more questions, you can uh, follow Luciani on Twitter or her social media or find her on, uh, on her own web page. And thanks. Let us uh, meet in the following webinar. Thank you, Luciani. Thank you, Alejandro.